So thank you for waiting. We would like to resume the uh, next session. So we would now like to invite Dr. Yoshihiro Kawaoka for his speech. Uh, are you ready, Professor? Yeah, I am. Yeah. So please. Thank you. Um, so the, as all of you know, uh, there have been multiple um, emerging and re-emerging infectious disease, diseases last several decades. <clears throat> When uh, viruses that are maintained in non-human reservoirs or small isolated human population transmit to larger pop human population, then we recognize them as uh, emerging viral infections. In my laboratory, we study uh, three emerging viruses, influenza virus, Ebola virus, and SARS-CoV-2. I'd like to acknowledge people who contributed to this work uh, because there are so many people involved. Um, I cannot uh, acknowledge them individually, but uh, without their contribution, uh, we could not um, achieve what we did. I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, past and current members of my laboratory in, at the University of Tokyo since uh, 1999 uh, and at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, this is the uh, building that uh, we occupy, the entire uh, building. And we moved to, um, to Wisconsin in 1997. I would also like to acknowledge uh, my mentor and the late uh, Dr. Nike who uh, taught me everything about the um, basics of the uh, um, experimental procedure development. And Dr. Robert Webster, who taught me everything uh, that I need to know about uh, as a scientist. Uh, he also helped me on the personal level. This is a house we lived in Memphis, Tennessee, and we had uh, trees in our backyard. And I wanted to cut them down. And Dr. Webster came to my house and he cl climbed, which I tried, but it's way too up so that I couldn't go up. Uh, but he uh, removed all the branch and cut them down. And he and his wife, uh, Marjorie, helped uh, us to establish uh, living in the United States and continue to do so, uh, help um, even now. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Drs. Nagai Nomoto and Arai, who recruited me to the University of Tokyo, um, and um, Dr. Mitsuya and President Kokudo, uh, who recruited me to the National Center for Global Health and Medicine. Uh, Dr. Mitsuya um, invited me to give a talk at the symposium. And after the symposium, he drove me around Mount uh, Aso. And while I was, we were in his car chatting, I mentioned to him that uh, I will be out of job when I hit 65. I was 64. And he more or less hired me right on the spot. So I very much appreciate your prompt action, Dr. Mitsuya. I also like to acknowledge funding and the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, and Science and Technology in Japan, and Japan Science and Technology Agency, and the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, and Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development, and the USNIH. So now influenza virus. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, influenza viruses infected between 5 to 15% of the population, which killed uh, half a million uh, people worldwide. Influenza virus occasionally caused worldwide uh, epidemic called pandemics. And we have experienced uh, 1918 Spanish flu, 1967 Asian flu, and 1968 uh, Hong Kong flu, and H1N1 pandemic in 2009. 
Among these pandemics, uh, 1918 Spanish flu was most devastating. People died due to viral pneumonia, but we, don't, we didn't know the molecular mechanisms. And Spanish flu uh, occurred before we knew it was uh, caused by a virus. And Spanish flu virus, therefore, was not isolated. Now, more than 20 years ago, we established a technique called reverse genetics, which allow us to generate influenza virus any way we like from plasmids. Jeffrey Taubenberg at the United States uh, sequenced the entire um, genome of the Spanish influenza virus from the uh, uh, tissue uh, who died um, due to Spanish flu. So with this information and this technology, we thought it is possible to address this question. Why was the Spanish flu virus so pathogenic? But we wanted to generate Spanish influenza virus and um, infecting non-human primates. I thought it is appropriate uh, to do the experiment under BSO-4 condition. So I collaborated with Dr. Heinz Feldman, who was in charge of BSO-4 facility at the Canadian Science Center uh, for Human and Animal Health. And two people from my group actually did the work. Darwin Kobasa, senior scientist at that time, and Hideki Ebihara, assistant professor at that time, now became the, uh, the director of the Department of ROG1, National Institute of Infectious um, Diseases. So we generated 1918 virus from plasmid, and we used 2002 human isolate as a seasonal influenza control. So we infected non-human primates with these viruses. On day three post-infection, all the animals infected with 1918 virus lost appetite. We took some, anima some animals for pathological studies. And on day six post-infection, one of them got sick so that we had to euthanize this animal. And we took some, some animals, again, for pathological studies. But the remaining three animals in 1918 group also got so sick on day eight, so we had to euthanize these animals. And uh, animals infected with seasonal influenza virus did not show much of the symptoms. So we were able to reproduce Spanish flu in macaques. And in fact, this is the only influenza virus that constantly kills non-human primates. So this is in, Spanish flu virus is indeed highly pathogenic. We then did analysis of a host gene expression in bronchi and found that uncontrolled innate immune responses are related to high pathogenicity of Spanish flu virus. So this is one of the early report on the um, cytokine storm in viral infection. Now H5N1, uh, highly pathogenic influenza virus. So this virus was first identified in southern China in 1996, caused an outbreak in 1999 in Hong Kong, infecting 18 people. Of those, six died. This virus then spread to Europe, now causing outbreaks in the United States. This virus is highly lethal in humans. But before this highly pathogenic H5N1 virus, it was thought that avian influenza viruses cannot replicate well in humans because a scientist uh, infected, experimentally infected humans with avian influenza viruses and did not replicate. And the reason why avian influenza virus that does, did not replicate in humans was thought to be the difference in receptor recognition between human and avian influenza viruses. Human influenza viruses preferentially binds to salic acid linked to galactose by alpha-2,6 linkages. Avian influenza viruses prefer alpha-2,3 linked salic acid. But highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses infect humans and even kill. 
y. So we tested distribution of influenza virus receptors, alpha-2, 302, 16 salic acid, by using lectins specific for alpha-2, 3 uh, salic acid, which is the avian virus receptors, and alpha-2, 6 link salic acid, that is the human virus receptors. So we uh, tested the distribution of the, uh, these salial oligosaccharides on the surface of um, human airway. And I found that cells expressed in the upper respiratory tract mainly express uh, receptors for human influenza virus, which is alpha-2, 6 link salic acid, but cells in lungs express not only human virus receptors, but also alpha-2, 3 linked salic acid, which is avian influenza virus receptors. Therefore, highly pathogenic H5N1 virus can infect cells in lungs and cause severe pneumonia. But if receptor specificity of avian influenza viruses changes from alpha-2, 3 to alpha-2, 6, they grow in upper respiratory tract where alpha-2-6 link uh, receptor is prevalent. Now, what does the virus replication in upper res respiratory tract mean? If the virus replicates in upper respiratory tract, the virus can transmit easily because uh, of the sneezing and coughing. So next question was, which mutations allow H5N1 viruses to recognize receptors uh, prevalent in the human upper respiratory tract? So Shinya Yamada, who was the, um, the graduate student at that time, addressed this question. So this is a schematic diagram of influenza virus particle. On the surface of the virus, there's a protein called the hemagglutinin, which is a receptor binding protein and the three-dimensional structure is known, and this is the receptor binding site. And we found that only three mutations make avian influenza viruses recognize human virus receptors. Now, in addition to mutations in, in hemagglutinin, Masato Hatta, who is the uh, associate professor in my lab in Madison, now became chief at the uh, USCDC, also found the additional mutation in polymerase that make avian influenza viruses replicate better in humans. But human-to-human -human transmission has been limited uh, with H5N1 virus. But if this happens, then we will encounter a pandemic. As you all of you know, based on the uh, SARS-CoV-2, for pandemic to occur with respiratory virus, Airborne transmissibility is essential. We use ferrets for this kind of studies as an experimental model because when ferrets are infected with uh, seasonal human influenza viruses, they cause symptoms like humans, sneezing, coughing, uh, sneezing, high fever, and runny nose. So this is how we do the experiment. We infect ferrets with an influenza virus, and next day, we place a cage containing uninfected ferret. But there's a gap between the two cages. So there's on, the only way for the virus to transmit from infected to uninfected is the respiratory drop, droplet or aerosol. So uh, under this condition, we first tested transmissibility of a virus that caused a pandemic in 2009. And this virus transmits very well between ferrets, so the positive control. But wild type avian H5N1 virus does not transmit at all in this condition. But only four mutations in the HA, hemagglutinin, make this virus transmissible in ferrets. And this work was done by Masaki Mai, a director of the, um, the the department at the National Center for uh, Global Health and Medicine. Now, another important virus that uh, we need to worry about is H7N9 avian influenza virus. This virus is also lethal to humans. But interestingly, when this virus was first recognized in humans, 
The virus came from avian species, but it was not pathogenic in avian species. But in 2016, this virus became highly pathogenic even to uh, chickens. And people got infected with this highly pathogenic form of H7N9 virus in mainland China and in Taiwan. So we tested transmissibility, airborne transmissibility of 2013 uh, low pathogenic form of the virus, low pathogenic to chickens, but pathogenic to humans. Interestingly, this virus had transmissibility in ferrets without any additional mutation. And this work was done by Toki Watanabe, who is now at the um, uh, University of uh, Osaka University, professor at the Osaka University. Then Masaki did a transmission experiment using this highly pathogenic form of H7N9 virus and found that of four, uh, out of four pairs, we saw transmission in three pairs. And two of these animals died. And two of these animals who got trans transmission, uh, transmission, the virus from these viruses also died. And we found virus replication in the brain. These brown cells are virus antigen, positive cells. So this highly pathogenic H7N9 virus transmits well in ferrets via respiratory droplets. And the ferrets die even with a small amount of virus in respiratory droplets. Now, uh, 2009 pandemic virus. So this is a cell producing 2009 pandemic virus. This filamental structure is a 2009 pandemic virus. This picture was taken by uh, Takeshi Noda, who is now professor at the Kyoto University. Um, this is an issue that we wrote and review in 2009. We infected uh, non-human primates with seasonal influenza virus. And seasonal influenza virus does not cause much of disease, not, uh, no, no uh, inflammation in lungs. And it is very rare to find virus antigen positive cells shown here, just one cell uh, in animals infected with seasonal influenza virus. But when non-human primates were infected with 2009 pandemic virus, we saw severe lesion in lungs and many virus antigen positive cells shown in these uh, brown um, cells. And this is very similar to non-human primates infected with Spanish influenza virus. So 2009 pandemic influenza virus replicated well in lungs, unlike seasonal influenza virus, which is consistent with viral pneumonia seen in severe patients. We also did some basic research, uh, that is the genome packaging of influenza virus. Influenza virus is unique in that its genome is fragmented into eight segments. And how these eight segments are incorporated into virus particles uh, was largely unknown. So Takeshi Noda, this is a picture taken by Takeshi Noda. These are the influenza virus particles, particles just about coming out of cells. And you can see viral genome hanging from the top. So he made slides of virus particle and examined from the top. Now you can see eight dot, one in the center, seven surrounding. And again, influenza genome is fragmented into eight segments. He then made serial sections of influenza virus particles and then examined from top to bottom. And he found this picture, that is number of dots gradually reduces from eight to six, four, and two. And he saw this not just this particle, but also all the other particles he examined. So what this tells you is that eight viral genome segments that differ in length likely eight different segments exist in virus particles. Now, for viral genomes to be incorporated into virus particles, 
it has to have this uh, packaging signal, which is uh, essentially the nucleotide sequence. So the question here is that are influenza viral RNA segments incorporated into virus particles randomly or selectively? If it's random, random, each segment contains common incorporation signals. But if it's selective, the each segment contains segment-specific incorporation signals and incorporated as a set. So people in my group uh, determine the incorporation signals, and they found that the, each segment contains uh, incorporation signals at both ends of the coding sequence of the segment. Each segment encodes different proteins. Therefore, each segment contains different segment-specific incorporation signals. So uh, viral genome of influenza virus is incorporated as a set and uh, virus bud out. So we believe it is possible to inhibit assembly of virus genome that's inhibiting virus replication. Now to control the influenza virus, we have two options, antivirals and, and vaccines. And Shuji Hatakeyama, Masaki Imai, and Maki uh, Kiso studied the emergence of drug-resistant influenza viruses and found uh, some of the drugs more, uh, more prone to produce uh, drug-resistant viruses than others. For vaccines, um, this reverse genetics technology is used to produce live attenuated influenza vaccine, Flumis, which is used in the United States and European countries. Uh, but the vast majority of the influenza vaccines are um, inactivated vaccines. And market share of egg-based vaccine is substantially higher than cell-based vaccine, even though efficacy of cell-based vaccine is better than egg-based. So we, uh, but the influenza viruses does not replicate as well as the, um, in cells as well as in eggs. So we modified uh, virus to replicate better in cells and uh, Kos Ketagada, who was a graduate student at that time, modified the cells to produce more viruses. So now I'm going to talk about the Ebola virus. As all of you know, Ebola virus is highly, uh, can be highly pathogenic, highly lethal. And I'm going to uh, cover two topics here, host responses and vaccines. First, host responses. As all of you know, we had a major Ebola outbreak uh, in West Africa uh, between 2013 and 2016. And we uh, went to Sierra Leone and did some research there. So this is the picture taken on the Christmas day of 2014 since then, I've been to uh, Sierra Leone multiple times. And we established a system to have two people always there and to do the research in 2015. So Toki Watanabe, Amy Eisfeld, Peter Hoffman, Tadashi Maimura, and Makoto Yamashita, and Satoshi Fukuyama went there, as shown here multiple times, usually two to three times, uh, two to three weeks each time. So what we did is shown here. So we obtained blood samples from people who got infected and survived. And, and people, for those, we have multiple samples uh, with five to seven day intervals. And uh, people who got infected and died. And for those people, we have only one sample because by the time we want to get to the second sample, they were dead and then blood from healthy individuals. And we performed a multi-omics analysis. And we found that the um, proteins involved in the neutrophils were upregulated, and therefore neutrophils may regulate Ebola virus, virus disease pathogenicity. 
We also found uh, multiple putative biomarkers in lipids, metabolites, uh, cytokines, and other proteins. But among these um, molecules, the L-threonine and vitamin D binding proteins stratify patients better than viral load, which was thought to be the gold standard for the prediction of outcome of infection. And both L-threonine and vitamin D binding protein are stably expressed in survivors, as you can see here, and clearly separated from data points of fatalities. So we have identified biomarkers for severe Ebola virus infection, and we can use resources for those uh, who need intensive care using this information. We also identified host proteins during replication uh, that are required for during replication of Ebola virus. Asuka uh, Nambo, who now professor at the uh, Nagasaki University, and Associate Assistant Professor Makoto Kuroda, and Director of Section uh, Department at the National Center for um, the Global Health and Medicine, Yamayoshi, um, Sei Yamayoshi, and Takeshi Noda identified these host proteins. Now vaccines. Like influenza virus, we also established the reverse genetics for Ebola virus. So we can generate Ebola virus from plasmids. Now Peter Hoffman uh, generated a mutant Ebola virus that lacks a gene essential for replication, VP30. Because of the lack of this gene, this virus does not replicate in normal cells, but does replicate in cells expressing missing VP30 gene. So we call it Delta VP30 virus, and we call, since this virus replicates only in the cell line, we call it biologically contained Ebola virus. Now morphologically, the Delta VP30 virus is identical to authentic Ebola virus. And in the United States, this virus is allowed to use B under BSL-2 condition. We next tested whether this virus can, be a, can serve as a vaccine. So we immunized non-human primates twice with this virus with 28-day 20, uh, intervals. And 28 days after the second immunization, we challenged them with 1,000 lethal dose of authentic Ebola virus. Without vaccination, when they were challenged with authentic Ebola virus, they all died. When these animals are vaccinated once with our vaccine and then challenged them with uh, authentic virus, one of them got sick, but this, vir this animal recovered and they all survived. But when these animals were vaccinated twice our vaccine, they survived and did not show any symptoms. <clears throat> We then inactivated Delta VP30 virus and gave two immunizations to non-human primates and then challenged them with authentic Ebola virus. And they all survived without any uh, symptoms. So with these positive data, we then decided to do a phase one clinical trial. So we generated uh, non-clinical and uh, clinical uh, grade vaccines uh, and in the uh, GMP facility at the University of Wisconsin, and then performed clinical trial at the Institute of Medical Science at the University of Tokyo. So this project was led by Toki Watanabe. We have two cohorts. The first cohort started uh, December of 2019. The second cohort was supposed to start in April of 2020, but because of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to delay the second cohort. So the work was done at the Institute of Medical Health Hospitals. And these are the members who actually did clinical work. Um, Dr. Tojo, uh, who was the director, the director of the hospital at that time, and Dr. Yotsuyanagi, who is the current director, and Drs. Fumitaka Nagamura, Tokiko Nagamura, and Dr. Koga, 
and the uh, Ms. Yoshi, who is the uh, head of uh, nursing department, and Dr. Zishigaki and Dr. Kuroda. Without their help, uh, we were not able to, of course, uh, to do these clinical trials. So we have two cohorts, and these two, two cohorts differ in the uh, antigens they received. The uh, second cohort uh, received five times more antigens than the first cohort. And these are the pictures uh, taken during the vaccination of the first cohort. The, this slide shows you the adverse events associated with the vaccine. We did not see any serious adverse events associated with the vaccine. And we are still analyzing the immune responses, but <clears throat> uh, here this slide shows you the anti-GP uh, titer. The GP is the glycoprotein protein on the surface of the virus particles. As you can see, uh, immune responses, antibody responses to uh, this protein in the beta in second cohort, which received high dose vaccine, especially second immunization. So in summary of this portion, uh, neutrophils may play an important role in the pathogenesis of Ebola virus infection. We have identified biomarkers for severe Ebola infection, and Ebola Delta BP30 shows promise as an Ebola vaccine. Now I'm going to talk about SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> so all the SARS-CoV-2 in my laboratory has been isolated by Yuko Sakai. And this, this is a picture taken by uh, Drs. Imai and Uji. And these are the people who worked on SARS-CoV-2 in my lab in Tokyo and Madison. Uh, they have been working so hard last uh, nearly three years and throughout the um, entire time. I'm going to cover two topics, Omicron and imaging. First, Omicron. As all of you know, the first uh, variant emerged, this alpha variant, that was taken over by the Delta, now Omicron BA1, BA2, BA5, and other subvariants. And in, in the United States, uh, the prevalence of BA5 is declining, and prevalence of other subvariants are increasing. The aim of this study is to, to compare the pathogenicity of Omicron variants. At the beginning of this pandemic, we needed to have animal model to study pathogenicity of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So we tested a variety of animals and found that marmosets and regular mice are not susceptible to the original SARS-CoV-2. But hamsters and uh, the cats are highly susceptible. So we infected hamsters with 10 to the fifth infectious units and found that on day three post-infection, we found more than 10 to the eighth infectious units uh, in the nasal turbinate and lungs. On day six post-infection, the amount of virus dropped by two log units and we did not find any virus in kidney, intestine, and blood. We then examined the lung lesions by using micro-CT. Before infection, seven days post-infection, and 16 days post-infection of the same animal. And as you can see, lesions were more severe on day seven post-infection, mostly recovered by day 16. So hamsters infected with SARS-CoV-2 share CT imaging characteristics with those of uh, human COVID-19 disease. Now, the high replication uh, in respiratory organs uh, in hamsters with this virus, also with this uh, uh, CT imaging, hamsters are a useful animal model for COVID-19 studies. And this model has been used extensively worldwide. So we infected uh, hamsters with a variety of uh, variants, 
and examined body weight change over time. And the variants that appeared before Omicron all cause body weight reduction. But animals infected with Omicron did not lose body weight substantially. We also examined the virus replication in nasal turbinate and lungs. On the three post-infection, we found Delta virus replicates better than all the Omicron variants by one log unit, at least, in nasal turbinate. And in lungs, the difference is more substantial. The, we saw two to three log reduction in virus replication with Omicron variants. But BA 2.75 replicates replicated better than other Omicron variants. We also examined uh, the uh, respiratory functions of animals infected with SARS-CoV-2 by using whole body plethysmography. And as you can see, animals infected with Delta virus show respiratory function failure, but the animals infected with Omicron did not show respiratory function failure and which is similar to previous infected animals, with the exception of the BA275 infected animal. We saw some um, respiratory function failure in one of the parameters. We also examined histopathology of animals infected with these viruses. And this work was done by Dr. Tadaki Suzuki at the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. And he found that uh, animals infected with Delta virus show severe lung lesions, hemorrhage, and infiltration of uh, the uh, immune cells, uh, but not in animals infected with Omicron variants, with the exception of BA 2.75 infected animals. So the Omicron BA 2.75 variant appears to be the most pathogenic among the Omicron variants, although it is still less pathogenic than the Delta variant in hamsters. So for all parameters tested, BA1, BA2, and BA5 showed similar pathogenicity. However, BA 2.75 caused viral pneumonia and was the most pathogenic Omicron variant we tested in hamsters. Similar findings have been reported by other groups. <clears throat> this slide shows you the amino acid differences between the original Wuhan strain and Omicron variants in the S protein, which is a surface glycoprotein. Black fonts indicates the uh, amino acid changes common uh, among Omicron variants compared with Wuhan virus. Blue indicates the amino acid uh, changes common among BA2, BA5, BA2.75. Red indicates BA1 specific, salmon specific, BA5 specific, and lavender indicates BA2 BA275 specific amino acid changes. So what this tells you is that there are many amino acid differences between Wuhan and these Omicron variants and each subvariant contains variant-specific mutations. We therefore tested efficacy of uh, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies, which are targeted to the S proteins of SARS-CoV-2. Um, this antibody cocktail, um, Ronapri from Regeneron, lost reactivity against all the um, the Omicron variants, reduced reactivity against Omicron variants. Sotrovimab also lost reactivity against most of the um, Omicron variants. Evershield also had reduced neutralizing activities against the vari uh, Omicron variants. However, Eli Lilly's Bebtrovimab retained uh, neutralizing activities against these variants. However, even this antibody lost reactivity against recent um, variant XBB and BQ11. So susceptibility to molecular antibodies differs among Omicron variants, and bevotrobimab is efficacious against, against many Omicron variants, but not B, uh, BQ11 and XBB. 
And similar findings have been reported by other groups as well. We next tested uh, effectiveness of these mole clones in hamsters. So we infected hamsters with SARS-CoV-2. Next day, we injected antibodies and tested virus replication on day four post-infection. Now, against ancestral virus, these antibodies reduce body, uh, reduce virus data uh, in lungs. And even in nasal turbinate, these antibodies, uh, Ronaprev and Evashield, reduce virus data in nasal turbinate. But against BA1, only uh, Evashield reduce virus data in lungs, but not in nasal turbinate. And against BA2, three monoclones reduce virus data in lungs, but not in nasal turbinate. We also tested efficacy of uh, remdesivir, montpiravir, and nirmatrelvir in first in cell culture. And these compounds are highly e effective uh, against all the viruses uh, tested. We next tested efficacy of monopiravir and nirmatrelvir in hamsters. So we infected hamsters with SARS-CoV-2 Next day, we started treatment twice daily, orally, with these compounds, and examined the virus data on day four post-infection. Against both BA1 and BA2, monopiravir and nirmatrelvir reduced virus data in lungs substantially, and, but not so uh, in the nasal terminal. So small molecule drugs currently in use effectively inhibit the replication of Omicron BA1 and BA2 in the lungs of hamsters. Uh, last um, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about imaging. The aim of this study is to understand COVID-19 pathogenesis by using the imaging systems. And this work was done by Hiroshi Ueki in my group. In my laboratory, we have established multiple imaging systems, but today I'm going to focus on this two photon microscopy. So this is how we do the experiment. We hit a mouse with a laser and then project the image on the screen. And a mouse is on the heated stage. To look inside the lung, we place thoracic window, which is connected to a vacuum pump. We have anesthesia machine, mechanical ventilator, and to, pre to re prevent contamination of these devices, we put HEPA filter. And the entire system is uh, housed in BSL-3 facility. So the operator wear full protective gear, as shown here. This is Dr. Hiro uh, Hiroshi Ueki doing the experiment. <clears throat> So the experimental uh, surgical procedure is shown in this slide. We perform tracheotomy and insert cannula, make incision, and expose lung. But the lung moves like this. So we have to stop the movement to observe. To do that, we place thoracic window, and then pull the vacuum so that the surface of the lung movement stops. And then we place objective lens and then observe. So to do a two-photon microscopy uh, with the SARS-CoV-2, we uh, infected um, human ACE2 expressing transgenic mice with SARS-CoV-2 expressing fluorescence protein Venus and this virus was generated by Dr. Kamitani at the Gurma University. We then injected um, fluorescent labeled dextran to look at the blood flow, and then antibody to neutrophils or platelets. And this is a lung picture, and gray indicates blood flow, um, green indicates uh, neutrophils, and red indicates um, uh, green. The, the green indicates virus infective cells, red indicates neutrophils, and cyan indicates platelets. And as has been reported, 
Type 1 and type 2 uh, alveolar cells were infected. So this is a real-time imaging of lung of uninfected animals, animals infected with SARS-CoV-2 days 4 and day 6. Red indicates neutrophil, and you can see the number of neutrophils increased upon infection, especially on day 6 post-infection. And neutrophil shown in red moves rapidly in naive animals. It appears and disappears. But in animals infected with SARS-CoV-2, especially on day six post-infection, neutrophil shown in red don't move. And actually, you can trace the movement of neutrophils. Y-axis indicates speed of the neutrophil. X-axis indicates time. And as you can see, there are many rapidly moving neutrophils in naive animals, but less so in day four animals. But there aren't many, almost no uh, rapidly moving neutrophils in animals infected with SARS-CoV-2. We also noticed that, um, we meaning Hiroshi, um, noticed the, the alveoli are cloudy suggesting enhanced vascular permeability. So we quantified fluorescent labeled dextran leakage into the alveoli. And as you can see, the leakage um, vascular permeability increased upon the infection. We also noticed um, platelets shown in cyan and neutrophil shown in red forms the uh, complex uh, microthrombi-like structure so the neutrophils that remain in blood vessels may cause the thrombus formation seen in COVID-19 pneumonia. We also noticed that the micro, uh, um, microthrombi formation shown in cyan here. So we extracted the platelet signals from the original image, identified platelets, and made a histogram. And we found that the number of single platelets reduces upon infection, but the number of aggregated platelets and thrombus increase upon infection. Now, lung is one of the organs where platelets are generated from megakaryocytes. And I'm going to show you a movie that megakaryocytes are torn apart for the generation of platelets. So platelets are generated from megakaryocytes by this method. And this is what's happening in naive animals. But in SARS-CoV-2 infected animals, megakaryocytes are trapped in the blood vessels, which may be a cause of embolization. Now, next, we examined blood flow by infecting mice, mouse with the SARS-CoV-2. On the six post-infection, we injected fluorescently labeled red blood cells, and then performed two photon microscopy, took shot every 1.2 seconds, and overlaid images. And this is the naive animal lung, and this is SARS-CoV-2 infected animals. Blue indicates blood flow. And upon inoculation of uh, red blood cells, when red blood cells pass through, these vessels become red, as shown here. In naive animals, all the blood, uh, blood cells, uh, vessels become red because erythrocytes pass through. But SARS-CoV-2 infected animals, the, these area, red blood cells did not pass through. So in lungs infected with SARS-CoV-2, capillaries available for oxygen exchange are limited. So two photon laser microscopy revealed that the functional failure of lung capillaries is likely due to microsome formation in mice infected with SARS-CoV-2. We next examined the pathogenicity in young and aged mice. To do this, we uh, made mouse-adapted um, virus. <clears throat> and this virus um, replicates mainly in respiratory organs. 
but we did not see much difference between young and old mice in terms of amount of virus in respiratory organs. But this virus killed older mice, did not kill younger mice. The 20-month-old uh, uh, B6 mice corresponds to about 60 years old in humans. And we saw severe lung lesions in older animals. And also the whole body plethysmography showed the respiratory function failure in animals infected with, uh, in the old animals infected with this virus. We next performed um, uh, two photon microscopy using young and aged animals. In young animals, we saw relatively smooth blood flow in lungs. The interestingly, this neutrophil stuck in the um, proximity of this uh, virus infected cells was pushed by the blood flow, extended and torn apart. As soon as that happens, the aggregation of platelets occurs. So this may be one of the cause of thrombus formation. Uh, in aged animals, pulmonary vessels are plugged with platelets aggregates and neutrophils. So impaired pulmonary blood flow may be a factor in the severity of COVID-19. So platelets neutrophil complex formation induces functional failure of lung capillaries in uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected mice. So in summary, the Omicron variants are attenuated compared with Delta variant. Uh, some of the molecular antibodies are no longer effective against some of the Omicron variants. The currently approved polymerase and protease inhibitors are effective against Omicron variants. And two photon laser microscopy revealed lung capillary congestion in live mice. Now coming back to this slide, um, obviously, SARS-CoV-2 is not the last pandemic virus. In fact, monkeypox virus caused multiple outbreaks in different countries. Last year, G7 leaders agreed to the 100 days mission, a commitment to produce a vaccine within 100 days of the emergence of a new pathogen. Therefore, worldwide uh, collaboration to prepare for the next pandemic is essential to mitigate damaging effects. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Kawaoka. So we would like to begin the Q&A session. If you have a question, please raise your hand in the um, venue or also in the <coughs> webinar. So some questions or comments from the audience? Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Carr. So lots of uh, very interesting data. Um, and uh, on the SARS-CoV-2 lung experiments, do you know the mechanism of the neutrophil stasis? I mean, are there nets? You know, is it DNA release? I think like a couple of reasons. Maybe the blood flow is actually congested. That's one reason. And another reason is the interaction between neutrophil and uh, endothelial cells. That's another factor. So multiple factors are involved, I think. And did you look for DNA extravasation? Like, you know, the mm -hmm. so-called net formation? Not, not under this condition. For flu, we tested. And we do see nets with flu and others too, but not with the SARS-CoV-2 infection yet. Okay, thank you. So any other questions or comments from the audience? Yeah, uh, Professor Okan, please. Yeah, Kawako-sensei, congratulations. Uh, it was amazing, your series of work. And I have a question about so COVID-19 issues and so it's realized that so uh, COVID-19 has uh, receptor other than uh, ACE2 okay so the, the susceptibility of the uh, animals okay specific susceptibility is dependent on the ACE2 
the structures. Yeah. So, for example, so flexing one or some uh, the molecules are likely to be other molecule. Okay, so that is uh, still a okay, receptor for the uh, COVID-19. So, does it mean that so uh, in for example, flexin one is uh, highly expressed in the brain? Do the uh, COVID-19 uh, able to infect in the mouse brain? Uh, independent of the, you know, in the presence of the Y type, it's uh, uh, S2, okay, uh, the g genotype, rather than transient. Right. <clears throat> so the mouse adapted virus recognizes as most likely mouse S2. Yeah. It doesn't go to the brain. Mm -hmm. So the, under the normal conditions, we don't see much of virus replication in any animal models except transgenic mice. Mm. Oh, okay. Thank you. <coughs> so, any other questions? Yeah, Professor Honda. Uh, Dr. Kaoka, uh, congratulations on the KO Prize. I'm, Thank you. I'm Kenya Honda from Microbiology and Immunology <coughs> Department. So I have a, a couple of uh, very much scientific, uh, maybe detailed questions. So why is it about the uh, genome assembly of flu? Yes. So you <coughs> clearly, uh, by using the kind of uh, EM tomography, you clearly show the, the genome assembly of flu. So, uh, and you identified that, uh, you found that each segment contains a segment of specific incorporations uh, signal sequences. So my, my question is, do you know what are the, what are the uh, host receptors for these uh, incorporation uh, sequences? <coughs> right, so we have multiple different theories. <coughs> one is the one that you suggested, there's a host molecule to which viral genome combines. But I think <coughs> probably that is not the case. Mm -hmm. Uh, not our work, the Takeshi Noda, who actually did the EM work, now following. And they are finding the um, sequences at the end of the one segment and, of the, and the other segment interact, which is actually the hypothesis that I had. I even had a picture. Uh, but now they're really showing that is the case. So. Interesting. And the other one is about the Ebola virus uh, uh, survivors. So you uh, found that, <coughs> for example, erythroleoni was higher yeah. in, in survivors. So do, do you have any mechanistic insight into yeah. uh, why erythroleoni is elevated in survivors? And do, do you know what the cells are the source of the erythroleoni? Yeah. We have no idea. We're just the biomarkers, and we have no idea about the mechanism, mechanistic reason why those proteins uh, you know, stratify. But uh, I'm you. looking forward to 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 further uh, information yeah. about this. Thank, Thank you. you. So, in uh, Professor Shiomi, please. <clears throat> so you use uh, both hamster and mice with human S2. So, which one can recapitulate more of symptoms observed with human? So the uh, hamsters actually the good animal models. Uh, without expressing S2, a human S2, they can be infected. And it's amazing animal model that in terms of transmission. So we actually can infect hamsters with one PFU platform unit. So one infectious unit can infect hamsters. It's very successful. And that is why transmission experiment works great. So we put the hamster and then uninfect the hamster next to it, and then we see transmission easily. Up until Omicron variants. For some reason, we don't see transmission with Omicrons. So all the variants, we see great airborne transmission, but Omicron, we don't see it. So we don't know why um, we don't see airborne transmission with Omicrons. But we haven't done the, this uh, infectivity assays, meaning how many infectious viruses are needed to infect hamsters with Omicron. We haven't done that experiment. So we, we need to do that experiment. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <coughs> yes, please. 
Hi, very good talk. I have a simple question. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the, even under the pandemic of Omicron, which is more contagious than the, the right type one, uh, the still, uh, youngsters, the newborn, or those people, uh, uh, have a, uh, don't get affected too much compared to adults or old, uh, people. Do you see any, anything like that in, uh, in your animal system? We have not, actually, um, uh, this mouse experiment is one of them. The older mice, right. older meaning 60 years old in humans, right. okay. Whatever. died <laughs> with the virus. The younger one, the uh, two months old, hamster did not. So uh, we do see this uh, difference in age in animal model too. You see that difference? Yeah. So what could be the, what could be the mechanism? See, all the men, all the people, everything is deteriorating. But, 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 but the, the <laughs> youngsters and newborns are more susceptible to uh, the pathogenicity of influenza, if I'm no, not no, mistaken. No. No, no, young people get infected, um, right. but older people have been exposed to multiple times to influenza virus. Mm -hmm. So we have basal immune responses to influenza virus. That's why when we get infected, we um, eliminate the virus quickly <clears throat> and recover most of the time mm -hmm. until we get really old. I see. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Y yes, please. Hi, I'm Yoshiko Takahashi, Kyoto University. Is there any evidence or do you have any evidence that, uh, <coughs> that in a human being, we uh, it's a question of diversity. Some people have higher level of ACE expression or some other people have lower, lower expression level of ACE or the expression, uh, the spatial differences of the expression of these receptors. So then the, the are we different? Is, is there any evidence showing that? Not the level of the ACE2 expression level, but there are now uh, some reports showing the genetic differences affect the, um, the outcome of the infection, which you would expect for any infectious diseases. So, uh, yeah, so they may not be the level of expression, but many other factors, host factors, affect the outcome of the infection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. So, any other, <coughs> any other questions? Yes. Thank you very much. This is Masa Amagai. <clears throat> um, because we, we will have another pandemic with another virus, and this battle will last kind of forever. But uh, you really created what happened to Spanish flu, and then you, sh you really proved it's really pathogenic. But on, on those days, people do not have any vaccination, any antivirus, but eventually they overcame. And also now we have a vaccination and also antivirus uh, drug. But in, for the next pandemic, what would be the best strategy to overcome? So, for example, maybe pro pre, uh, make the vaccination, but it, it does not necessarily prevent the virus infection completely. So maybe uh, lesson from Spanish flu, people may should, uh, should get actually infected. But how do you make that balance? And what is your uh, recommended strategy for the future pandemic? Sure. So the pandemic can be caused by, most likely caused by, respiratory virus. Um, so we focus on respiratory virus. And most of them are RNA viruses. So we focus on RNA viruses. And then make drugs that are effective against many RNA viruses. So, so far, antiviral development is focused on certain viruses. But now, um, the you know, theme is changing. More towards making like antivirals, uh, anti, uh, antibiotics that work against multiple family of viruses. So you, you, we get ready for any new viruses. And, and, the, and this 100 days mission is one way to do it to, for 
uh, vaccination. So prepare vaccine and also prepare antivirals ahead of time and to cope with the um, next pandemic. And I think it's possible. It's possible. And the other way the, in terms of antiviral uh, development is targeting host proteins. Now, many people worry about side effects, but um, there are redundancies in system. So the viruses use one molecule that can be uh, used you know, substituted by some other host proteins. And so, so we, we've done some, some of those experiments. So knocking down the mice, the making knockout mice so that the mice survive and targeting those, you know, tar the proteins and so for antiviral development. So th there are many ways to do it. So prepare, preparation of uh, antivirals ahead of time and making vaccines right away. But again, we know what will happen. So the, for pandemic, it's a respiratory viruses. So we focus on them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from the audience or from the webinar? Any questions? So now we have reached the end of the q and session. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kawaka. Thank you. <clears throat>